how and, and what to believe. We want to believe what we want to believe. But the reality is, is that we should believe what the Word of God says, and we should believe what the Spirit of God says to us in our spirits, okay? So, so it's okay for you to have your belief about something, about a subject, about a matter. It's okay to have your belief about it, but you, what, what we believe ought to line up with the word of the Lord. You just can't believe anything you want to believe, okay? This, this is not that, because we are supposed to be led by God. And God speaks to us through his spirit. And no matter what we, no matter what you think, it is what the Bible says. Listen, lying is wrong. Lying is wrong not because I say it is or you say it is. It's wrong because God says it is. And that's the point. It's not about what I believe. It's what God says. And I should believe God's word. Not only should we believe what God believes, but we conspire to take over his rightful place to rule over us. We conspire we conspire to take over We conspire to take over his rightful place to rule, to rule over our lives. Okay? The, the, the person who wants to rule over our lives is God himself. Okay? You are not the ruler of your own life. And many of us have learned by now that when we have ruled over our own lives, we have found ourselves in trouble. We made a mess of things when we did it our way. And the one thing you have to come, the one thing you have to come to conclusion about is that I can't do it my way. I have to do it God's way. I have to let God rule over my life. Now, those of you uh, who've been in Bible study for a while, you know that we know that Jesus Christ is his Savior. Okay? And we love that. We love the fact that he is Savior. He, he came to save us from our sins. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He is Savior, and he did come to save us from our sins to the point where he went to an old rugged cross. He went to the cross, he hung, bled, and died, and on that cross he paid the price for all of our sins. All of our sins were put on Jesus Christ when he was, was nailed to the cross. He bore all of our sins. So he is Savior. And when you accepted him as Lord and Savior, he forgave you of your sins. He set your life on a different path. He made a way that now you have eternal life. And he washed away, wiped away all of your sins. So he is Savior. Uh, but I believe that what he more so wants to be for us and what we should let him be for us, we should let him not only be Savior, but we should let him be Lord. He wants to rule over our lives as Lord. Okay? He wants to be in charge of our lives. 
I've, I've seen I've seen the uh, bumper sticker that uh, I'm the pilot and God is my co-pilot. Well, I think I think the reality is that we should just let God be the pilot. Let him be in charge. God doesn't even need a co-pilot. All right? And I don't know what makes us think we qualify to be a co-pilot to God. We just need to let God, when somebody say, God, take the wheel. We need to let God take the wheel. And when we do that, we will find that our lives are tremendously blessed when we let God rule and reign over our lives. All right? So today, we want to look at uh, a couple of stories about rebellion. Um, let me make this illustration first, uh, is that the first rebellion happened in, in heaven itself. The first rebellion was in heaven uh, with uh, the angel named Lucifer. Okay? And Lucifer was... Um, his name, his name means star of the morning. Star of the morning is what his, his name means, okay? Uh, he held a high, he held a high ranking position in heaven, okay? Uh, he had he had exquisite beauty. Okay, he had exquisite beauty and great wisdom. He had exquisite beauty and great wisdom. Okay, and he was given a position of power. and influence. Okay? Star of the morning, high ranking position in heaven, exquisite beauty and great wisdom, and he had power and influence. Okay? So much influence that that became a problem. So much beauty that became a problem. So much power, influence, beauty, that it became a, a problem because now he was not satisfied with just worshiping God. Instead, he wanted to be worshipped. Okay? He himself wanted to be worshipped and he placed himself above God, which caused him to be kicked out of heaven. All right? Now, there are some scriptures, a couple scriptures I'll give you, okay? Ezekiel, you can read these. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. And the other scripture is Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Those are two scriptures about Lucifer, his relationship in heaven, and why he got kicked out of heaven. For time's sake, I'm going to let you read those scriptures uh, after uh, the Bible study is over today. Okay? Once a beautiful, powerful angel of God, he lost his former exalted position in heaven because he exalted himself above God. All right? He exalted himself above God. And, and that ultimately is the problem that we have with God. Whenever we want our way instead of God's way, we are saying that we think our way is better than God's way. When in fact, it is not. We have to always make God the priority. His way is always the best way. I'm going to say that again. 
His way is always the best way. Look back over your life. Look back over your life. And when you look back over your life, look at the times you got in trouble. Now, now, two things. Sometimes God allows some things to happen. God will allow us to go through trials and tribulations and heartaches and hardships. But sometimes the trial and the tribulation and the heartache and the hardships are caused because we have a hard head. Our heads are hard. My mother used to always say a hard head makes a soft behind. And whenever we walk outside of the will and the way of God, we are headed for trouble. All right? Now, sometimes we are lulled into a false sense of security because God is long suffering. Sometimes it takes God a long time before we see the fruit of our sin. It doesn't always happen immediately. Sometimes it takes a while because God is long-suffering. The long-suffering is God's way of trying to get us to turn back to him on our own. It would be good, it would be perfect, it would be nice if we would see the error of our ways, if we would see how our sin hurts God and how our sin ultimately, ultimately could hurt us. And God being long-suffering is a chance for God, is God giving us a chance to turn back to him to repent and to turn back to him. That leads me to this point. That leads me to the point of a person can be rebellious against God. Okay? A person, a believer, can be re in rebellion against God for whatever the reason. Okay? And thank God for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is in us to guide us back to God. It is God speaking to us, trying to say to us, come on back, turn it around, get back on the straight and narrow, okay? So a person can be disobedient to God, okay? But what else we have to learn is that sometimes our sins impact people around us. Our sins can impact people around us. Family members, friends. No man is an island. Sometimes when we go astray, it has an impact on those who love us. So we should we should be mindful of that, okay? What really led me to this study about rebellion is that I, I'm going to say again, I believe that God is trying to get our attention. That's what I believe. I believe he's trying to get each one of us. He's trying to get our attention. I've had time, you've had time to be by yourself, okay, to be on your own, okay? You've had to, you had to slow down. You couldn't do some things that you usually do. And I believe it's a good chance for all of us to take inventory. That's, that's a good word. Inventory of our lives. Look over our lives and see things not only that you did bad but look over your life and see things well because everybody under, under the sound of my voice you do good you do good things you do things well and you should take account of that be happy about that be proud about that 
encourage yourself in that, that you do some things good. Uh, you have heard the saying, I know my mother, that's the first person I heard say it, even a broke clock is right two times a day. So you're not bad all the time and in everything, okay? There are some things you do well, and it would be good for you, you know what? It would be good for you to take inventory of things you do well, okay? Some things you do well, it would be very good for you to take inventory. I do this, I do this well, I do that well, I do the other well, take inventory of that. Okay, listen, the devil going to really remind you, that's his job. He's going to remind you of stuff you don't do well. Believe me, he, he's going he's gonna to beat you over the head with that. Okay, so, so always remember, you do some things well. Okay, but it's also a good time to take inventory of our lives and recognize that there are some things we need to work on. We do not do some things well. And now is a good chance uh, to say to God, you know, now that I had time to sit down and be quiet and look at it, God, I see where I could have done some things better. And I'm sorry about some of the things I've done against you. I'm sorry. Shouldn't be some of the things. I'm sorry for the sin that I've committed against you. Good, good time to take inventory of our lives. And again, I believe this nation is going through what it's going through because of the leadership of our nation. And that is across the board, okay? Israel had a king, okay? You go from a person uh, who has responsibility to others. Well, the king has responsibilities to a nation, He's the head of the nation. And God looks at that king and how that king rules and reigns over the nation. And Israel's problem was, and if you listen to the message Sunday again, Israel's problem was that most of the kings that were appointed were wicked kings. And because they were wicked, they they. They made the nation decline. There was a decline in the nation. Okay? A decline in the... And, and sometimes those declines made God respond in a negative way. Sometimes he responded in a negative way. Well, he responded that way not so much to destroy the nation... But he responded that way to get the nation to turn back to him. Even if the king would just turn back. I believe there would be a change in the nation. If the president would turn back, there would be a change in the nation. Because it does matter who the leader of a nation is. It does matter who the leader of a family is. It does matter who's the leader of a, co of a company is. All those things matter, okay? Because wickedness starts at the top and trickles down. Just like the anointing of God starts at the top and trickles down. It flows down to the beard, down to the skirts. Okay, it's the same way with the kings in Israel. And I think this country is going through what it's going through because those of us who are leaders, notice I didn't say those of you, I said those of us who are leaders, we have turned our backs on God. There are some things we have done and do that I believe God is not pleased about. Okay, so you have the person you have the king, you have the president. Look at some nations uh, that, 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 that are led by, by dictators. And those dictators treat the people in such a way that's just brutal. Just brutal, 
Okay? So it does matter who the leader of the nation is, who the king is, okay? Who the president is. It does matter who your congressperson is, or your senator is, or your representative is, who the governor is, who the mayor is. All those things matter because at some point, at some point, what, who, how they lead us impacts our lives. In the long run, it, it comes back. It's like a boomerang that you throw it and that boomerang comes back. And sometimes uh, we go through things because the leader has set in motion some things. And God responds to those things. And he sends a pandemic to a nation, to a world, to get our attention. Now, that's, that's my personal belief. I believe that based on how I read scripture. I believe that based on just what's going on in my, my time of being away from church and my time of being away from Sunday school and my time being away from people and friends, okay? I just believe God is just trying to get mine and yours attention along with the world's attention. It would be, wouldn't it be something if the president of this country would lead the country in a word of prayer? What would that do for this nation if he would just come to a point where he would bow down to God and humble himself to God and pray for this nation, I believe that God would respond to that. In the meantime, we should be praying for him. As difficult as I find that sometimes, we should be in prayer for him that God would take out that stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. We should be praying for our leaders that they might do the right thing. You can't be in love with power and mistreat men. You can't be in love with power and then lead the nation down the wrong course. We need to be in prayer as individuals. We need to be in prayer as a church, the body of Christ. This is a time of prayer and repentance. Uh, St. Luke, we're going to go to St. Luke, the Gospel of St. Luke, the Gospel of St. Luke, and we're going to look at the 15th chapter, St. Luke 15, beginning at verse 1 through 7. That's where, that's the first scripture we want to look at today, all right? Uh, the first scripture we're going to look at today is the Gospel of St. Luke, the 15th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 7, all right? In this chapter, Jesus tells a series of parables, okay? He tells uh, three parables in a row, okay? And the parables answer the murmurings of the religious leaders. Uh, the religious leaders saw who Jesus hung with. He wasn't hanging with the people he thought, they thought he should hang with. So they murmured, whispered under their breath. And, 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 and let, me, let, me, let me say this, and this is a little sidebar. Ain't nothing, like, ain't nothing like a person who murmurs. They won't come out and say it, but they'll just, ain't, 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 nothing, ain't nothing like a murmurer. Okay, uh, they don't, they don't, they just won't come out and say what they want to say, but they say it under their breath. And the Israelites got in deep trouble because they murmured against God. Okay, uh, their murmuring against Jesus was this man sits down and eats with sinners. Okay, 
he sits down and eats with sinners. And, with, and when Jesus got wind of what their murmuring was, he began to tell a series of parables. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. And by now, y'all should be able to define parable in your sleep. I know I keep defining it over and over again, but for those who may be uh, new listeners or hearers, watchers or hearers, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The Greek word is parabole, meaning to throw alongside. To throw alongside. Jesus told an earthly story and right beside that, that earthly story, right in that earthly story, there was a heavenly or a, a spiritual meaning, okay, to throw alongside. And we talked about how parables uh, usually had one one real point they were making. Now we take parables and we take it apart from top to bottom, but usually a parable only had one main thought, one main idea, okay? And parables, Jesus told me because he said it was given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom. It was given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom. So he would tell parables. Another characteristic of the parable, however, is that there were attentive and unattentive hearers. For the unattentive hearer, the person who came and really didn't want to listen, really didn't want to get anything, they were just being a spectator pretty much. Uh, they just showed up to see what Jesus had to say. They really didn't want to really get what he was saying. Uh, for the unattentive hearers, the meaning of the, the parable would, would, would slip their understanding. They wouldn't get it. They couldn't get it. <clears throat> because their heart was in the wrong place. But then there were attentive hearers, those who really wanted to get and understand kingdom principles, who wanted to understand what God was really like and what Jesus was saying in the parable. And if you were an attentive hearer, you would get the understanding of the parable. This parable, Jesus, again, he tells based on the murmurings of the religious leaders, okay, he tells the first parable, which is the parable of the lost sheep. The parable of the lost sheep. And when you read it, listen to what the Lord says. I'm just going to talk through it pretty much. Which of you, if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one, wouldn't you leave the ninety and nine and go search for the one, all right? Now, now look at what the Lord is saying to us, that if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one, some of us would say, well, I still have 99, so I'm just going to just be satisfied with the 99. But, but listen to what God is saying. I don't even want to lose one. I'm going to leave the 99. I'm going to go searching for the one, all right? <laughs> now, in my former church, and I don't know if any, any New Collins Temple members are on the, on the line, 
in my former church, there was a song that the choir sang, I'm so glad I found Jesus in time. Well, the reality is, is that we didn't find him. It was the Lord searching for us. He was coming for us. He was looking for us. He left the 90, 99 and he went after the one that was lost. The parable points to how precious how precious even one was to God. The Bible says that it is the will of God that none should perish and all come to repentance. That's what the Lord says. And even the one, God is searching for the one. I don't know about any of you today, I am so glad that God kept looking for me. He would not give up. He would not give up on me. He kept looking through all of my mess, through all of my faults, through all of my failures. He kept right on looking for me. I am so glad. I don't know where you were in your life when the Lord saved you. I know where I was in mine, and I'm so grateful today for what the Lord has done for me. I'm so glad he did not give up on me. And the same way God doesn't give up on us, we should not give up on each other. We should never give up on each other. We should be there for each other. And I, I'll go a step further. Never give up on your children. I, I don't care what they're doing. I don't care where they are. Don't, don't give up on them. Keep praying for them. Because if God saved you, he can save them. If God changed you, he can change them. All right, now I know I know my, my eldest son Michael usually watches, and um, I'm I'm glad he watches. By the way, and and I pray for my children. Okay, I I pray for all of them: Michael, Demar, David, Marissa. I pray for my children. Okay, I pray for them because I want I want them to be all that God wants them to be. And God has the power to turn every situation around. So we should never give up on each other. He left the 90 and the 9. And he went searching for the one. You the one today. <laughs> Write some way in your notes. You the one. Put that in your notes. You the one that he did not give up on. Uh, uh, the Bible says that the, the, the shepherd went searching for the sheep. Did you know that even when he searched, when the shepherd was searching for the sheep, even if the sheep was found dead, the shepherd had to bring it back so that they could find the cause of death. They just didn't just throw them away, but they had to find out what caused that sheep to have died. That, that's how important that sheep was to that shepherd. But he left the 99, went after the one, and guess what? He found it. And when he found the one that was lost, he puts, he puts the sheep over his shoulders. And he goes back home. And he says to his friends, rejoice with me. For I have found that one sheep that was lost. And look at how Jesus ends that first, that first parable, I believe, in verse 7. Listen to how Jesus ends that parable. For there is joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. And whenever somebody comes to repentance, 
There is joy in heaven. Some of y'all know by now, whenever somebody accepts the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives, you know, the one thing that I, I ask us to do is to, to rejoice. And I let them know that heaven is rejoicing with them because they have come to repentance. They are now saved and they are members of the body of Christ and they have inherited eternal life. That's how he ends of the first parable. But then there was the second, the second parable. And the second parable, verses, verses 8 through 10, verses 8 through 10, okay, and that is of the lost coin. And here Jesus tells this story. He tells this story of uh, which of you, the woman, which of you, if you had 10 pieces of silver and you lost one, and the Bible says that when that woman lost one piece of silver, she had nine left, but she wasn't satisfied with nine. She wanted the 10. She lost one of the ten. And she did what? She swept the house. I can see it now. I can see it now. Her going through the house, sweeping and turning over stuff, looking for that one piece of silver. Now, the importance of the silver, some say, William Barclay says, that it was a part of her wedding dowry that she received those 10 coins when she got married as part of her dowry. And in today's language, it would be as if this woman lost her, her wedding ring, her diamond wedding ring. And you and I both know we don't want to lose anything. And sure enough, we don't want to lose no But this was a part of her dowry. And because it was part of her dowry, it was, it was important to her. It was precious to her. And the Bible says that she did what? She swept the house. And finally, she found that lost coin. And when she found the coin, she did what? Called to her neighbors, say, rejoice with me. For I have found the one lost coin. And Jesus ends the parable by saying, There is joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. And we need always to remember that. Listen, the sheep wandered away. That's what sheep do. Sheep wander. There's the song that says, Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Sheep wander away. They, they just gradually get away from where they're supposed to be, okay? Somebody asked the question, well, well why did Jesus say they were lost? Because uh, he knew where they were. Well, lost is translated, lost is translated in the wrong place. It's not that it is that we are lost. It's not that God doesn't know where we are. He knows where we are. But sometimes we are in the wrong place. Okay? And thank God for his Holy Spirit. Because one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to let us know when we are in the wrong place. So the woman found the, the lost coin, the, 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 the shepherd found the lost sheep, and both of them rejoiced, and in both Jesus said, there is joy in heaven over one lost sinner when that one loss comes to repentance. But it wasn't finished. 
and we have a few minutes left. I don't think I'll get. I don't think I'll get uh, through this parable. But then we have uh, the third parable, and that's in verses eleven through twenty-four. Verses eleven through twenty-four. Okay, and this is the story that most of us call the story of the prodigal son. That, that's how most of us have entitled this story. But the reality is that the, the real hero, and, and I've, I've, preached from, um, I, I've preached from this, uh, I've taught, I've taught from, from this scripture, okay? And for many, many years, uh, we, make, we make the good story out of the prodigal son. That, that he usually gets all most of the attention. Uh, but really today, the real hero in the story isn't the son, but the hero is the father. The, the true hero is the father, okay? And, and my topic has been God's response to rebellion. Okay, and this story is going to show us God's response, one of his responses to rebellion. One of his responses. I think, I think it depends on the situation and the circumstance uh, that God builds in uh, what he's going to put us, the person, through. Uh, how he responds to our uh, disobedience, our rebellion. But the real hero in the story is, is the father. This parable is about a father who had a father who had two sons, okay? Elder, younger, okay? The younger son goes to the father and asks the father to give him his inheritance. Give me the portion that falleth to me. Inherently, that's kind of disrespectful because the father was still alive. And usually inheritances, inheritances come when the father dies. But this boy could not even wait for the father to die before he asked him to give him his inheritance. Give me. The portion that falleth to me. All right? The Bible says, look, look at the response of the father. The father let him have it. Okay? The father gave it to him. Okay? Now, there's, there's another point I need, I need to bring out here is that the oldest son, the older son, was entitled to two-thirds of the father's inheritance and the younger son was entitled to a third. The oldest son would get two thirds, the younger son would get a third, okay? Uh, the oldest son would keep the favor of the father. He would be the one who would carry the bloodline of the father, okay? But this younger son got a third of the father's inheritance and the Bible says that he left town. He got out of town. He took what the father gave him and he went to a foreign land. Okay? While he was gone, the Bible says that he spent, he spent all he had on riotous living. Okay? He squandered what he what, what, what the father gave him. He, he squandered what the father gave him. Okay? And he left and he spent it on riotous living. Now, now the Bible doesn't say what, what he did. Okay? And, and the genius of the Bible, I, I think, is that Jesus allows our imagination to take us there. What would you spend your money on if you just wanted to get, want to put your head down? You just want to get loose. You just want to party. 
What would you spend your money on? I think that's an individual thing, okay? And all of us know what you would do with your money, okay? Uh, but he spent what the father gave him on riot. He, he wasted. He wasted what the father gave him, okay? Uh, part of, this is rebellion. Uh, wasting what God has given you. That, that's part of rebellion. Uh, it, God has blessed all of us with some things. And believe it or not, you are blessed with it in order that you might help build the kingdom of God here on earth. That's why God gave that to you. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to live good lives. But ultimately, God blesses you that you might be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Lord, I wish that would get across today. I, I wish I could really convey that message to you today. That, that everything you have ought to glorify God. Ought to go towards building God's kingdom here on earth, building God's kingdom in your church. It is not for you just to go and do whatever you want to do. You, you ought not be like that, that farmer whose barns were overflowing. And the farmer looked at all that he had and he said, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns. Didn't talk about sharing it. Didn't talk about blessing anybody. What, they talk, what he talked about is, I'll build bigger bonds. And we live in a nation. We live in a nation of, 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 of people who believe that what they should do is build bigger bonds. They're not really trying to share it. Some do. I, I, I can't, I'm not making a blanket statement. Some do. Many do. Uh, I, we talked about, I didn't know, even the late Kobe Bryant. I didn't know he was so generous with his money. Uh, gave to different causes. Okay? And, and, and each of us, whatever you have, God gives it to you that you might be a blessing to the kingdom of God. This boy wasted what he had. And then when what he had ran out, he joined, the Bible says, he joined himself to a person, a foreigner of that country where he was. He joined himself to a foreigner, okay? He's broke, he's poor, he's wasted what the father gave him, he's wasted it in riotous living. And the Bible says, now that it's all gone, he, he now finds himself to be to be in want. <laughs> now he wants what he wasted. He began to be in want. And now he is so hungry that he does something that any Jew would never do. And this is one of the inside stories of, of, of the parable. He's so hungry that he's, he's, he's feeding, he's feeding swine. And not only is he feeding swine, he's eating what the swine eats. Now he's, he's in a bad spot, okay? Now he's broke, poor, hungry, destitute, okay? Because when we walk away from God, when we walk away from the Father, that's what the boy is guilty of. The boy is guilty of walking away from his Father. And sometimes what we are guilty of is walking away from our heavenly And God's response to our walking away 
is sometimes to let us suffer in order to get us to repent and to turn back. Well, I'm going to close there. I'm out of time. It's about 1 o'clock. I see Sister Redden coming to Coming in, the, coming in the alternate sanctuary. Amen. Uh, so I'm going to close right there. I pray that you were blessed by the Bible study today. Uh, we're going to pick this back up next week, okay? And again, know that God loves us so much that even when we rebel, God just don't, he just doesn't turn us loose. God comes looking for us. He comes to find us right where we are. And thank God that he is a forgiving God. And he's a God of restoration. God will restore you back to the place where you belong in the first place. But we're going to close right there. I pray you enjoyed the Bible study. Are there any questions? Any questions today? All right. If, if, there, if there are no questions, um, Sister Haynes, are you on the line? Sister, I'm here. Yes, ma'am. I know that you want you want to. Yes, ma'am. If you would. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Haynes. Did, did you want me to leave the call, Sister Haynes? So yes, you can. Ma'am? Yes, sir. All right. After prayer, I'll leave the call, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Brother Dill, do you on the line? Brother Dildy? Yes. Will you close us out in prayer, please? And after the prayer, will you please stay on the line? Sister, Sister Haynes uh, wants to make an announcement. If you will stay on the line after the prayer. Go ahead and lead us, Brother Dildy. Okay. God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Have a great day in the Lord.